everybody. We're going to be really informal tonight because we hope that that will lend itself <coughs> to conversation and not just presentation. My name is Chris. I work for the American Composers Forum. We are office up on the fifth floor of this building, and we're a nonprofit organization that uh, places com uh, composers in communities and uh, all over the United States in residencies and commissioning projects and gets new music created and out there where people can hear it and experience and be part of that creation. And we are really excited to be partnering with the Minnesota Music Coalition for these workshops because independent artists, composers, everybody's making music. We're all doing the same thing. We all are basically speaking the same language. And the more of us we can get in the room together, the better. So this is the second of three workshops. They're all being filmed. And you can get in touch with us if you don't already have the link from the last one. We'll be filming these, putting them up on YouTube. Um, this one, no, the next one is on November 19th, and it's going to be about being yourself on social media. Your artist self, your person self, are they the same, are they different, are they be consistent? And uh, tonight, we're going to talk about interviewing, and I'm going to pass it to Thanks, Chris. Uh, my name is Helen Stanley, and I'm Executive Director of the Minnesota Music Coalition, the other organization presenting uh, this series of workshops. And uh, the Minnesota Music Coalition, if you don't already know, is the only statewide nonprofit devoted solely to supporting musicians of all genres, all levels, and uh, helping give musicians the tools they need to be more successful artists, including professional skills, uh, creative training, wellness resources, um, etc. So, uh, if you want to learn more about us or how to become a member, we do a reciprocal membership at Composer, the Composers Forum. So we offer a discount if you're already a member of Composers Forum, so you can learn more. You can talk to me, go to our website, pick up materials. Um, also out there we have information about the Year of Music Micro Grants Program, which is a special uh, program we're running through the end of the calendar year, which is uh, designed to fuse more music throughout the city of St. Paul. And uh, if you want to apply to present music, um, and we will pay the artist fees to $500. So it's a very cool program, and you can learn more about it as well. So, but I know you come to hear about that. You came to hear about impactful interviewing, which is uh, tonight's topic. Uh, last workshop, we talked about writing about your art, crafting an artist statement, uh, and also sort of figuring out who you are as an artist and how you can do that in the to other people. And maybe if you've done your job really well, is crafting a great press release and uh, creating a great bio and being able to communicate that, maybe you might demand an interview. So then what do you do? So that's what this is about tonight. It's not just how to uh, set up an interview. This is really about how to make the most of uh, speaking opportunities so you can uh, really convey what you want to convey about your music. Um, and about your message as an artist. So, uh, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, in addition to my work at the Minnesota Music Coalition, I actually used to be a publicist for Red House Records, so this is something that I used to deal with a lot in uh, prepping artists for interviews and also dealing with unsuccessful interviews and how those can go wrong. And I'm also a radio host so I, and an artist, so I fit on both sides of that equation and I know how, uh, as I'm sure John can attest to, how things can go wrong in interviews. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, not that you've ever had a bad interview, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Um, so that's who I am, and I'll just let everyone else on the panel first just start by saying who they are and uh, what they do, and maybe their experience of interviewing or yeah. Being interviewed. Yes. <laughs> mostly. Um, my name is John Monson, and I am a musician in the town of, of the Twin Cities, the towns of the Twin Cities, and have been for, I guess, the last 30 years or so. Um, uh, I learned the most that I ever wanted to know about being interviewed when my band Semisonic had a, a platinum record success and a number one song called Closing Time, which you guys may have heard at the end of, at the end of some night that you spent at a bar. And uh, at the time that that song um, was going up the, up the charts, actually, at, at that time and in the years prior to that, it, did, it seemed like about a thousand uh, interviews at radio stations. And um, so I learned a lot about being interviewed at that time. And then after the record came out, we started having more success with a bunch of press interviews. And, uh, and so learned about how to, how to conduct those types of interviews, 
well settled. And then in the years since then, which was around, give or take, 2000 or so, I've got uh, a couple of other groups, one called The New Standards, we're doing a holiday show at the State Theater here in early December, and then another group called The Twilight Hours, and we just put out a record called Black Beauty. Um, and we're not getting as much uh, press attention as we'd like for that project, and so if any of you guys have any ideas, <laughs> do about that, it would be great. But, uh, so yeah, I've, I've been involved in trying to wrangle the press's attention and radio attention for most of my whole life. And it's, it's definitely a, a big, important ingredient of your success as a musician. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Andrea Svensson, everybody thinking you read The Current. Uh, I'm the host of the local show. Story, your story, 
your content, what are three things you want the media to know about you or your product? Um, it's easier said than done. I bet if I asked half of you in here to tell me three things right now that you would like the media to know, you'd stumble a little bit or you'd be like, oh, this one's more important, that one's more important. It isn't necessarily the same key messages across the board. It depends on what the content is, who the audience is. But for the most part, you get you get those three things and you need to embed them and memorize them and make them incredibly natural. And that is what you want to convey. Um, you're your best or worst publicist. Uh, media actually wants you to look good. They don't want a crummy interview because it makes them look bad. You, you know, listeners don't want really to be in. So um, one of the things is don't go into it with the mindset of they're out to get me. They're out to find the juice. They're out to you know bring up that late night I had you know, at the club last week. They're really not in most cases. <laughs> um, and it's okay to say no. If you get an opportunity, you really need to evaluate the opportunity. Even if you're just starting out, it doesn't mean that every interview is going to be worth their time. So look at it. Is it uh, that somebody's saying, yeah, I'd like you to contribute to our blog and blog five hours a week for the next five weeks while you're on tour? It may not be the best use of your time because maybe that audience is 300 people. But you may be able to do something more impactful to a larger audience. So you just gotta do a little research and um, have a good idea of, you know, really, is it worth your time? Um, uh, sorry, just looking here. Um, reaching the right people, so we talked about this is gonna be a better time to have access to media because there are so many channels between um, blogs and social media and broadcast and radio and on and on and on. So there are lots of opportunities you have to, you know, where do you go for your news? What do you like to read? Those are sort of the places that you hope will reach out to you or that you pitch um, to try and get some coverage. But be familiar with, you know, if, if you're pitching um, Andrea for a story and it's nothing that she really has ever covered before because it's just out of her wheelhouse. It doesn't make sense to, to try and pitch it to her. You know, you can try and convince her all you want how great you are, but if that's not what she knows and what she's comfortable with, it's just not gonna, it's not gonna happen for you. Um, so know your audience. What's their reach? Are they reaching people that you want to have become fans? Are they reaching, um, you know, is it more of a are you wanting to talk more about the business of music or the creativity of music? You know, just again, refining those points and getting to know them really well. Um, the most common interview mistakes, guessing, which I think we've seen a lot during this political election. <laughs> if you don't know, don't make it up. There is nothing wrong with saying, I don't know. Can I get back to you? Um, you know what, I wasn't prepared to answer that question. I need to go back and get some more information, but we'll get back to you, but do not miss. Uh, body language, be engaged, um, smile, have a good time, actually look like you're excited that you're gonna get some publicity and some press out there, because it can be a lot of fun if you relax. Uh, volume and tone, project, be clear. Uh, you know, if you're, I have a client right now, I'll give you an example, he is um, a restaurateur that, <clears throat> has a lot of interviews, and he is not a morning person. He what? Not a morning person. So we recently did a radio media tour with him, which started about 5.30 in the morning. The first 10 interviews were horrible. I mean, it didn't matter how much sleep he got, he just is not a morning person. So that was a huge learning to say, no, it doesn't matter, we're not scheduling anything before noon for him. Um, so those sort of things, you know, do it when you're up, when you're ready, when you're vibrant, something to say. Um, and then one word answers. Not a simple. Um, if you want people to know your story, you actually have to tell it. And then um, preparation, which I talked about early on. Researching the reporter and the outlet, knowing your key messages. Um, if you're doing something like a junket or you've got uh, a week long of you know, back to back to back interviews, that's an opportunity for you to kind of decide what topics can I give to this one, and then I'll talk about something a little different with this one. Uh, it might be a songwriting process for this reporter, or the story behind the song for this reporter. 
but have a couple things in your back pocket that you can change it up so that you're getting more exposure for your product and your brand by doing that. They're getting different um, slices and insight to who you are than the same, um, the same story to seven different outlets. And practice, 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 which um, obviously it's just like music. You have to practice it to um, get it down, and it's not everyone's comfort zone. Doesn't matter. Uh, I was actually looking at some interviews that went right and went wrong, and Elon Musk, fantastic interview, hates it. He's a, he just, it's just not his comfort zone. So when you go back and look at some early interviews, you see how he's slowly started to find his comfort zone, and only, you know, he sticks to his messaging, he sticks to the things that he knows that he doesn't have to pull out cards and, and remind, you know, remind himself about. Um, do mock interviews with family, with friends, do it to yourself in your car. Um, so, Kelly, uh, you know, when was the last time you, I don't know, I something, did, didn't pay the parking here, which I didn't know outside. Um, but, and, then, and then you, you know, think about what your answer is going to be. Is it going to be long? Is it going to be short? And play it back. And just keep doing that over and over. Throw yourself a few curveballs. Have, you know, someone else, like if I said, so John, um, tell me about, uh, have you ever you know, seen somebody break their guitar in the middle of a show? You know, and he might be like, well, that has nothing to do with what we're here about. But that's the curveball. How's he gonna get out of it? How's he gonna bridge back to his key messaging? And it's those sort of things. So, you know, run, run through all those scenarios, especially with people who know you pretty well and they know kind of what your triggers are. Um, quick tips and tricks. We talked about a few of them, but um, identify no more than three key messages. Repetition, whenever you're doing an interview, whatever those, whether it's an um, on sale date, a price, a project, um, remember to put those in the interview multiple times because you have no idea where they're going to edit the piece. A lot of that could end up on the floor, but if you've said it three times in the course of an interview, it's likely at least one of those will get in there. Um, your critical stats, again, do you have a web address that you want to send people to? Do you have a phone number? Do you have, again, those sort of things. Typically, one of your key messages is going to be, to find out more information, you can go to X, or here's my blog, or here's my web page, those sort of things, here's my demo. And respect, treat your competitors with respect. Um, it's really, just don't even get into the business of bad nothing other musicians, companies, anything. It just doesn't, it doesn't serve you well. Um, and it's easy to get into, but find a transition. Um, so something like, you know, I can't speak for other musicians, but what I can talk about is my project today. So, you know, working on some of those things. Um, bridging, which I mentioned, it's one of the most important tools. So whether the conversation goes off track and you've got to pull the whole thing back, or if it's something that you're not comfortable answering and you need to figure out how to get out of it. Um, and there's just, there's all kinds of phrases, but just a few, you know, what I can tell you is blank. You know, what's important here is uh, something else to consider. I'd also like to add something we haven't discussed. It's a way to get your messaging back in there. And you do you. That's, it's as simple as that. Nobody knows your story better than you, but you can't tell your story for four hours. So again, hone it, figure out what it is, and your key messages will change throughout the course of your career. In the beginning, it may be all about, you just need, you need awareness of your name or of your artistry. Later, it may be more about an album. Later, you know, and then further down that, it may be more about career. So they can change, but know what you need to be focusing on um, and it's okay to talk about other stuff than just music. So, uh, what are your political convictions? What are your, you know, relationships, past struggles? Um, some topics are key informers to the music itself, and others are just personal points of view. So, Bono, for instance, is a great example. Obviously, he is constantly being interviewed for stuff that has nothing to do with his music. And on the other hand, he might do an interview about his music, but he might use his feelings about social injustice as a way to explain how that informs some of his writing. Uh, same with um, 
Yo-Yo Ma with peace and politics and performing. He likes to read all those together. Um, Eddie Vedder, when he testified um, before Congress about uh, you know ticket gouging with Ticketmaster, had nothing to you know. Yes, he was a musician, but he was not there to play a song and make them all happy. So it's okay to go down that path without feeling like you're missing out or giving up any part of the interview opportunity. Um, well, I'm glad you mentioned the redirect because I think this is something that comes up a lot, both on an interviewer and interviewee side. Um, that uh, you know, someone asks you about something that maybe you're not either either you don't want to talk about, or it's not something, as you said, that you know a lot about, or it's not on topic. Um, and and that can be a really easy thing to just go down a rabbit hole and you can't get out of it. But again, if you have those tools, like those three things. Um, it's funny, I also used to tell artists the same thing, but, but if you have three things, even if they're simple, like my website, my show, my album, you know, like three really basic things, but if you can at least work those three things in at one point, those are pretty easy to redirect to as well, you, you know, even if you are answering a question, it's not that you should never answer the questions, but there might be a way you can just slide that, those little, like think of them as little components you kind of fit in whenever you can. Um, certainly, when I'm on the radio, I do something similar so that there's never there outside of interview context. I always, you know, I always have the station ID on my show. I have other things that I'm going to mention throughout the show, and I, if, if I'm fiddling with the CD player while I'm talking because I don't have the song queued up, I, I have these components like, that I can just call up and just rattle off while I'm doing other things. So I think anytime you can have those talking points that you probably honed in from last month's workshop, right? Uh, those, uh, those things that make you you uh, that you want to talk about, uh, I think the better the better it is. Now I want to ask Andrea, especially because um, something that Kelly mentioned was that um, you know sort of be someone that they want to talk to and be someone that they that want that they want to interview and hopefully interview again. Um, and I know that not all interviews are like that. Um, but I also like to ask Andrea uh, about like. Because not all, I think there's an assumption that when you're being interviewed, that you're the only one who's uncomfortable. But I think often the interviewer is as, especially if they're a big fan or something like that. Like I'm betting the first time you interviewed Prince, that was like, I'm interviewing Prince. <laughs> I would pee my pants myself. But um, so I guess I'd, I'd like to get your take on that, Andrea, of like, uh, how do you feel when you go into an interview? You know, what do you do to prepare to feel comfortable with the, your subject of your interview? Yeah, I mean, I think that's from both sides the biggest thing to overcome is just the nerves and the awkwardness of the situation. It's like you're having a conversation, which we have all day long as people, but it's going to be like in the permanent record of your life. <laughs> um, so you want to get it right, and you want to say smart things, and you want to come across um, as a genuine person. So I think anything that you can do ahead of time just to um, not psych yourself up, to get yourself in a situation where you're going to feel as relaxed as physically possible um, is a really good thing. I just recently, this year, since I've been doing more radio, um, I've been doing more interviews in the studio um, and in our performance space, which is a, a big, beautiful studio at NPR where we have the bands come in and play, and it is really nerve-wracking to be in there. Um, I didn't expect that until I was in there doing my first interview, and I totally get why everyone looks terrified. <laughs> um, because you're in this huge room, you've got these headphones that make you realize how many noises your mouth makes. Like, I didn't know <laughs> that much was going on. Um, but it's it can be really intense. So you have compassion when they're like, Absolutely. Trump is sniffling. You're like, <laughs> but that really happens. <laughs> Um, and I think that whether you're coming from either side, you could um, make that happen. Like, I'm really terrible at small talk, but I try to at least ask them a couple of things that are just very casual people questions, you know, like, 
How was your trip? Yeah, <laughs> how was your trip? You know, a lot of bands are on the road. Like, are you stir crazy? Where, have you done anywhere cool? You know, um, what's the most interesting thing that's happened to you? Um, what do you eat when you're on the road? You know, boring people, stuff like that. And then it kind of gets them loosened up a little bit too. So anything you can do to break down those walls and like remember that you're both just people. <laughs> that well, was good. And also getting there early. I mean, presumably if you're not there early, you wouldn't have that opportunity because if you're rushing in at the last minute mm -hmm. to do an interview, which sometimes that's how the universe works, but if you at least allow some extra time, then you can get there, get settled. I mean, everyone's just like show performance. Interviews are another kind of performance, and it's not natural for a lot of us. You know, you think, oh, I'm great on stage. I, I can talk on stage, and I can play my music. And, but somehow talking to just this person who's across the way from me is somehow more terrifying. So if you have much in the way that you pr prepare for a performance, maybe you have a routine in your green room, you do vocal warm-ups, you do something to calm your nerves, in a similar way, figure out yeah those tools of how you can calm yourself and be yourself uh, for the interview. So, I was think um, I was just thinking about those NPR interviews in that studio, and um, and I always can get really a, a, a little bit extra excited for those because it, the space is really kind of intimidating, and mm -hmm. so it's and there's tons of microphones, people kind of rushing around and setting mics and stuff. And the thing that I love in that situation, and I think um, that actually over the years, um, probably 90% of the interviews I ever did were with my bandmates. There's some, I mean, and I can, I could see how it could be uncomfortable for the interviewer to have like this whole posse of people kind of standing around, you know. But if you're a band, you have bandmates who basically kind of have your back a little bit. It's nice to have them along for the ride. And a lot of times for radio interviews, you know, you're going to be doing a little bit of performance too. And so you have your, your guys there who will laugh at your jokes even if the interviewer doesn't. You know? <laughs> and that, that can be a big that can be a big help and give you a, an ease that you might not otherwise have if you're just having a face off. Right. Um, so. Yeah. And I would say if you are doing, especially a radio interview with a band, if you're a member of a band, do have those someone as a designated person. Not that other people can't talk, but have someone who's going to step up. Because I will say from experience being interviewing bands live in the studio, and this is live so you can't just edit out the awkwardness. <laughs> um, uh, the hardest thing is you ask a question, and, and I learn. I'm like, okay, I, I will direct my question, and I often ask before I go on air, I'm like, who's the best person to direct questions to, at least to start off with, just to get the conversation going? Because there's nothing worse than you ask the question, and you're like, so, how's the, yeah, how's the tour going? And then it's like, like they're all looking at each other, like, are you going to talk? No, yeah. no. Are you going to talk? <laughs> so I would say, at least sort of have that, that game plan. Otherwise, it's a voice from the back of the room that no one can hear. All right. Sorry. 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 Kind of what you're comfortable talking about, and then it helps them form some of their questions if they don't have them all. Um, a good interviewer will always ask, asked, yeah. like, what do you have coming up? What's going on right, right. now? What's important? So it'll give you an opportunity to kind of frame those things for yourself in case you didn't know. Which, if you're on, like, out on the road and you don't know, then you're true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I would say that hopefully when you set up the interview, or in preparation for the interview, whether you are dealing with a person himself like Andrea, or whether it's a producer, an editor, maybe it's someone else on the other end um, who you're setting up the interview with, you should definitely, of course, give them all your materials then, like your most recent press release, you know, some, maybe some little points of what you want to talk about. Do that at the front end, even when you're setting up the interview. But of course, as we all know, we've showed up for interviews where that message either didn't get through to that person, <laughs> or they just lost it, and they figure, I know this band, and, uh, and are reading it, um, which is why, again, mentioning it to the person right before the interview, never 
never hurts because they don't always know your music like you might think they will. <laughs> Um, I was just uh, telling these guys before that I was uh, interviewing a, a pretty famous uh, folk legend for my radio show, and I, the publicist had not confirmed until the day of that I'd be doing this interview, so I didn't have a lot of time to prepare, and they did not send me any PR materials, um, so I did my own research. Uh, luckily, I, I at least try and do that, so not all teachers would. But um, I went to the website, and I knew she had a new autobiography, so I was had questions prepared. I hadn't read it, but you know, I read up on what it was about and some of the reviews, and then I, I had a song prepared where I thought was from her most recent record, but apparently her website was not up to date. The publicist did not send me any information, but I didn't find this out until I was doing the interview. Um, and what was, uh, so that was not only so embarrassing for me, but it ended up being a bad interview because she corrected me on the air in a very rude fashion, I must say. Um, and uh, instead of saying, like, uh, and she, this was an example of a poor redirect, she said, like, I, I asked some quotes, I asked something about the, about the, something relating to the book, and she said, she just said, well, obviously you haven't read it. And I was like, and of course I bit my tongue from saying, well, I just, I found out I was interviewing you today, and so no, I did not read the book, but, um, but you know, I said, no, you're right, I have read it, but you know, tell us more about it, and you know, I did the redirect, but um, then there was another point where she corrected, because I, again, did not know she had a, a brand new album, so uh, she could, instead of just saying, well, actually, I have a new album now, and I would have just gone with it, and be like, great, tell me about it. Uh, instead, she's like, she's like, that's not my most recent album, and she just, she didn't even continue the thought, and she didn't tell me what the new album was, so I had to say, oh, well then what is the new album, you know? Like, so it was really, ultimately it made, sure it was embarrassing for me, but I'm used to that. Um, <laughs> it was more, it was, it was actually, it was worse for her, um, because I got calls from listeners who were like, I'm really sorry about that interview, she was off. <laughs> and this is someone who's a pretty big name, so it was, uh, and I've gotten a lot of requests when she's come back to town to interview her, and I've turned them down. And I'm a little community radio station DJ, but I don't, I volunteer my time, and I have no interest in interviewing someone who's unpleasant and unprofessional to interview. Uh, so, Can you uh, say who it is or no? Well, not, not, I, you can, we'll talk later. <laughs> it's on the <laughs> line. Um, but anyway, so, this is going back to Kelly's point. Be someone that you want to be interviewed. Um, and in this case, I'm probably the only DJ in town who probably plays her music. So it's probably it's bad for her, even though it's a small radio show, relatively speaking. Um, so you want to be someone who like is pleasant, who answers questions, who shows up on time, uh, because there's nothing worse than not being interviewed again, unless it's just a bad experience. Those <laughs> people that you're doing the interview with are so important no matter how big a jerk you think they are. And, and actually, in, in a lot of cases, there's there's some real, real jerks out there. I mean, yeah. there really are. I, I mean, and they're, they've been put in positions that, you know, I, I mean, you, you wonder how that ever could have happened, <laughs> you know? Uh, but they have, a, in many cases, they have a huge audience. Uh, I mean, sometimes the bigger the jerk, the huger their audience. <laughs> Turns out there's more than one just the jerk you're talking to. <laughs> I don't know exactly what the math is on that. It's a uh, It's like a coefficient, um, corollary value. Um, anyway. Um, it was all the way up to the president, something like that. So anyway, uh, I, I think in that moment where you could feel humiliated, um, or awful in some way, you kind of have to suck it up and make the best of it, and and uh, you know try and be your most affable, best self, and just kind of put away your negative feelings. Because storming off the air is it just does not it doesn't make you look good at all. That's a clip that they then play over and over. It could happen. Over again. It yeah. could happen. Yeah. And then other and other times, you know, people who. Maybe you would think would be incredibly intimidating and awful. We did an interview with Howard Stern, and we were really terrified of going in and inter interviewing with him because he was at the kind of the height of his powers at this time. And we're, you know, I mean, we're kind of still coming up a little bit, and 
and um, he was so notorious for being inappropriate and outrageous. <laughs> and we're all a bunch of the guys in the band and, and myself are basically a bunch of softies. And if we're challenged at all, we just like go. <laughs> 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 um, but he was incredibly, he was incredibly warm, super smart, very engaged, asked great questions, very curious. He'd obviously been really you know, he prepped great for the interview, and it was a great interview. And I think a lot of people, I hear from people who have heard that interview over the years, and they're like, that was really remarkable, and you perform, how did you perform like that at 5.30 in the morning? It was like the crack of dawn, and, um, and it was, it, you know, so it can go all different ways. But you just really do have to be your best self. That's, that's critically important. And if you can make the interviewer laugh, then you're winning. If you can, if you can be amusing and fun, then you're winning. Yeah, and I think that what, something Kelly had mentioned about talking about non-musical things, and we talked about this a little bit last time in our in our writing workshop, our workshop about writing your press materials, about the importance of putting in other things about that inform you as an artist that might not be musical, um, but it's like I like to cook or I like to do that, making sure that that they know those interests and also that you get to know their interests because hopefully if it's a, uh, someone, uh, well like Andrea, Andrea I know because Andrea's talked about this on the air that she loves otters so you know for instance if I was an otter lover you know like that would be something like interesting to work in. Uh, now I don't recommend you guys all send press releases talking about how you love otters so I'm here because she'll be very suspicious. Maybe <laughs> You know, they're more likely to, because I love asking people about like books they've read and mm -hmm. other things. I mean, just things that fill them out as people. And, and because when you do enough of these, especially music interviews, it's easy to get the same questions. Like, I bet you could rattle off. What are, what are the questions that you were asked more, most commonly? Oh, God. Um, do you write lyrics or music yeah, first? That's yeah, one of my that's favorite that's questions. What are your influences? Of course, that's always a, that's a, a, yeah. in the first three or four. Yeah. Know? And then, like, tell us about the record. I mean, and that's oh, obviously. You want to give the person an opportunity to talk about that, but it's easy to feel like you're asking the same questions for every interview, and so the more you can give them different material to work with, I think it definitely makes it easier. Well, also, I, I think it's um, after the interview is. I mean, we're talking about before the interview, getting some level of comfort. After the interview is also really important because optimally you're going to be asked back again and again and again, or at least once, or maybe a couple times. And so, um, there's a, what you you you're, an interview is kind of a transactional relationship. You know, both parties are getting something from it. Hopefully, you're providing the if it's a radio interview, you're providing them an opportunity to make great radio that's going to be on the air and it's going to be appealing to the listeners, and so the listeners will want to tune in. But then. There's also a human relationship that you're hopefully forging, and the human relationship is more important than the transactional and business relationship on some level, because if you can actually make a human connection with this person, and it's not, I'm not talking about being a big fat phony, I'm talking about actually being an authentic human being, and just kind of engaging with this other person as a human being, and, and trying to detect their interests, authors or not. Yeah. Um, uh, then you have a, a better chance of maybe getting to go a little bit deeper the, the next time. If you have a two minute interview the first time, maybe you have a five minute interview the next time. And then you develop relationships sort of like where you are, you want to have them back so you can delve into these other topics. Because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, and uh, I'm guessing Andrew's had this experience where there's artists who it's like, they're not my favorite music but I just love them so much. I could have them on any time. Whereas this other, again, famous musician who's, you know, much bigger name, and I have no interest in having them on. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a waste of my time and air time. We have a two-hour show once a week. Why do I want to spend 15 minutes with when someone who's so awful? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I have other people that I want to talk to. So um, I think that there, there is no greater compliment uh, if they're feeling it, at least as a publicist, the reporter says, God, that was, we'd yeah. love to have them back sometime. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know when, but they were terrific. I mean, that's... 
And I, I don't say that to everybody, and so that's why you vote for. And I bet you've gotten the opposite comments too. I, yes. I know I did as a publicist, and I worked with great artists, so it wasn't about the music. This is just purely about the experience of interviewing them, mm -hmm. where I've gotten comments on both sides, where it'd be like, um, I, you know, we, we, we love their music, but they were just an awful interview. You know, we probably won't have them back. I'm like, oh, that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> I worked so hard for that. I know, too. That, and that is the worst. I mean, you know, you, you hate to put that much effort into it and then get that opportunity and have it squandered. Yeah. I just want to ask, you know, is, uh, uh, what are some of the strangest or uh, off guard questions you've ever heard about uh, in any interview? Pretty much anything Mary Lucia asked. <laughs> Yeah. Probably 1988. 
And it really is, it's like one of those, just, you know, just, I'm, I'm sure you could ask almost any musician who's done a lot of these types of things, if they could call to mind some of their most humiliating moments, and they could definitely do it. I'm sure they could. I'm positive they could. At least it was an era where everything wasn't documented, too, for all time. That's right. Yeah. It's because, no I mean, that's, that's another thing, is that so many of these interviews, I mean, if they really never air, but chances are, it's there somewhere. So being aware of that is is uh, is probably good. Um, you know, another thing you were mentioning about how no one was talking, and it's true for radio, that's like the DJ's worst, I mean, for true. live radio. I mean, that's like the worst thing. It could be worse than you, th yeah, for, I mean, I would never kick someone off for saying that, but, you know, like, but the day air would freak me out, <laughs> like, uh, right. which is why I would just move on. But um, so I would say, find something to say. I mean, again, even if it's just repeating, oh, but, I'm repeating my top, my three talking points right now. <laughs> yeah, or, or a, a potential redirect on that might have been, you know what, honestly, I got nothing. But I can tell you the funniest thing that happened. Yeah. I mean, you can, you know, you know they're looking for, for something fun. Yeah. yeah. But at least you're answering. Mm -hmm. and. Um, And if, and if you're really not talkers, I mean, maybe live radio isn't something you do. And that's something you mentioned. <laughs> you mentioned something that, um, like, for finding the appropriate format, and, and whether it's not just the timing of the show for that morning person, but maybe it's like, we get really nervous when we play live on the air in a way that we do on stage. And I've certainly experienced this, where I was like, first time I was like, oh, I've been on the radio tons hosting, and I played on the stage, it should be done. And then the first time I was on the other side as an interviewee playing live on the radio, I got so nervous and I was really surprised. You know, sometimes you learn things about yourself you didn't know. And I now I know I'm like, okay, if I'm playing live, I have to do a really simple song that I've done a million times that I can't mess up because I just got really nervous. And they're so staring completely by three feet line, away from you. Know, you know, yeah. that it's gonna start rising up. You know? So but if you have at least one of those negative experiences, learn from that and be like, okay, either I can find a way to work around that or, um, or if we're all introverts and need to really know the people we're talking to, then maybe we don't do a lot. Maybe we only do recorded interviews, email interviews, yeah. blogs. I actually, if I could take that fantastic opportunity to segue, because I don't know, when I think about all the musicians I know and all the musicians I work with and, and even myself, Actual on-air live radios are, are only a small percentage of the opportunities mm -hmm. that we get to talk about our music. Um, I'm thinking of times when it's been a newspaper person talking to me on the phone, or now there are podcasts, or there are email interviews. Do you have a moment to kind of help us tie together how some of these things can be helpful for some of the other <laughs> possibilities of how we're going to be talking to the media about our work? Yeah, most of my background, is, like I said, is in writing, um, and I wrote for a newspaper for many years and edited for a newspaper. Um, the thing that I learned about doing that is that you want to get them to say something that isn't sounding like a press release. <laughs> um, so literally the most off-the-cuff moment, like as you're standing up from the table, could be like the pull quote in your article. Um, so I think thinking about it from the musician side, I would just be super aware that if it is going into print, literally anything that you say or any way that you act might be what they latch on to for their piece. We always tell our clients that there is no such thing as off the record, and especially today with social media. So it's just, just don't even, don't follow it. It just, it just doesn't exist. And one, oh yeah. I was going to say one thing that I've I, that I, I, started to always ask for is if they're recording it. Mm -hmm. um, 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 mostly because I want them to be recording it because then they're more likely to get the quotes accurately. Um, oh, you mean for writing interviews? For writing, for writing for interviews. Writing. Because you'll be amazed at how many times you'll be wildly misquoted. Wildly misquoted. Mm -hmm. and, and you'll just be like... <laughs> and and I, I found that while um, a lot of reporters won't give you a preview of the story, which they you know, certainly don't have to, they will sometimes send over the quotes, at least to say, you know what, I can't give you the whole article, but what I can do is say, here's the quotes I'm using, this is what I recall is accurate. And there's nothing wrong with asking for that, they can still say no, but I'm finding more and more that they are willing to at least share 
um, the stuff that go into our plate. Right, because they'd rather that than have it be called out later and somehow correct. Yeah, exactly. Um, the other thing uh, I was going to say about the about the, about the writing is, is again going back to Kelly's point earlier about knowing both the interviewer and the audience for that outlet. So, you know, if if you're getting asked these questions, you don't want to copy and paste from a press release, even if they mention your talking points, because it's boring, right? I mean, they're trying to get a sense of you. Uh, so really answering every question fresh, as opposed to like, you know, it's easy to just copy and paste or whatever. But I mean, I think it really needs to be you talking or whoever's doing the, the thing, really speaking in one voice. So I think that, I'm guessing that's what you're looking for, right? Mm -hmm. It's a sense of uh, the person as an artist. So that knowing, and I would say in general for going back to Kelly's thing about knowing the purpose of the interview, certain platforms are better for other things, um, depending on what you're trying to get across. So again, know the audience, uh, what song might work on the current might not work on Jazz 88. So like <laughs> tailoring uh, what you're doing to, to those else have any questions that answer your question? This is great, thank you. I've noticed like another trend where some writers or some musicians, composers, are also really good commenters about the scene. And then they kind of become like the go-to resource person for the media. Like, mm -hmm. um, okay, Ethan Iverson, that's very geeked out. Piano player in the back bus, he's a jazz performer, but he has a blog, it's great. Because he's so geeked out that if you really want to know about something going on in jazz or maybe even his take or opinion on things, for he just recently withdrew his relationship from Steinway <laughs> for political reasons, right? So how do I know that? Because he's getting he, what he's writing about on his own blog is kind of like, whoa, you know, this is this issue is having repercussions in the community, and he's <coughs> quoted from his own verse, so he's taking full liberty in his own writing, but he's kind of seen as a source, which is like another angle to, you know, not just about the album or about the show, but kind of like position yourself as someone who knows the scene. It's like a continual interview that you're doing with yourself, just talking about ideas <laughs> that are interesting to you and putting it out into the world mm -hmm. and that people can consult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, that is a, that's an interesting idea in a way to kind of give people access because yeah. that, after all, is what the whole interviewing process is about. Mm -hmm. Depending on the medium, anytime you can bring it back to something that's relatively uh, current, so you know, say within within that week, the week before, of something that's getting some attention, if somehow that lends itself to be part of your story, it's a great way to keep that conversation going. And then, you know, in most cases, that outlet it has already covered whatever it is that's gotten so buzzworthy that now you're able to work it into your story. It just helps keep it a little bit fresh and makes it seem like you're not so much in this little box and all you're worried about is you and your music. It's, oh, well, they're actually aware that there's this going on or this going on and you know, this is taking off. So um, not that you have to study for events, but I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's perfectly great to interject that stuff and just freshen it up. And in a similar fashion, in terms of relating to current events, also relating to place, I think that's really important, especially if you're on the road and you're, or you're doing an interview at a place that's not your hometown. Um, I think <coughs> it's really, the more you can relate to the place that, of the, where the outlet is, I think the better. If I interview a musician and they're in town, like Dakota, and they're like talking about being by the river and like, you know, you, like you're so much, you already have, feel like an instant connection and people can relate to that in a way that seems special. Um, I, I think that can open up a lot of windows and it just shows respect for the people you're talking to in a way that I think is meaningful. More on that topic a little bit, I guess. Um, one of the things that was a big advantage um, for, or it, it has, was, and continues to be a big advantage um, is being from here. Um, and knowing something about the music scene here in the Twin Cities, it's actually something that's quite unique and not 
typical around the country. There's probably about three other cities that have a music scene that you were approaching as good a, a quality of music scene as ours. And so if you're engaged with the music scene here and you can talk about that with an uh, interviewer and know something about it or be able to talk about bands that are kind of currently of interest to you or musicians who are doing cool things, that's, that's good. It gives you credence in some, on some level too, especially if you share some of the same interests um, with the person who's interviewing you. And it's like, oh, this, this person speaks the same language as me. I think that's a, that's a, a good, good place to be coming from. The other thing I wanted to say, um, unrelated to that topic, um, is that I think it's really important. I'm terrible at this. I mess sentences inside sentences. <laughs> and, and I do not speak succinctly, but in the course of an interview, it's really important to speak succinctly, and almost in a way that's ridiculously soundbitey, because especially for a press piece, less radio, because you can communicate so much about who you are with your voice, things like that, but in a press interview, it's got to be tight. It should be tight. And they're going to be, if you don't do it, they'll do it for you. You'll, they'll just edit your, your quotes. And that, in many cases, is probably a good thing. But if you can do it for yourself, it'll be good. And then another thing that you said, and I don't even know if you necessarily meant it, but you said to play back an interview. If you can record yourself answering questions into your voice memo on your phone and, and just try to respond to some questions that you make up for yourself, and then listen back to it and hear how many sentences just run on and then kind of dissolve, you'll, you'll start to get a better idea about how to present yourself. And that's really what it's all about, is you're, you're presenting yourself, you're making a compelling case about you and why what you are interested in and what you do is important. So it's a good idea yeah. to kind of like sharpen that it's sword. It's painful, but it's really helpful. I mean, I know it's like, oh, I don't want to listen to myself. This is terrible. Um, but it will make you a better better interviewee. I know I do it. As I listen to my show every week, not because I love listening to myself, but because <laughs> it makes it a better show. I, I mean, I learned from my mistakes. I'm sure Andrea's like, yeah. I started to do a radio show the first time. You're like, ah. Um, but, uh, I, like for instance, I'm sure you guys have all like been on like your home videos, or maybe you've been on television. Like you see yourself and you're like, oh, I should have worn more makeup. But that's usually my comment because I rarely do. Um, but it's a similar idea, right? You see yourself or, or hear yourself, how other people are hearing you, and you <coughs> react to that, and you'll make yourself better. And you um, want to yeah. <laughs> yeah, the strongly advice of being videotaped. Yeah, better. Yeah, because you'll find that you have little nervous ticks and things that you didn't realize existed. Right. Uh, I have a client who is a terrific interviewer, um, but most of his interview situations are pretty close like this, kind of one on one. And but when we started videotaping, what he finally realized I kept telling him was when he's a little nervous or it's a larger room, he talks with one hand in front of his mouth. Oh no. And while you can still understand them, it's a really weird thing to sit there because we visually, if it's a broadcast, I mean, you sort of watch people's lips. I mean, you're not lip reading, but it's just what we do. And so that sort of starts to distract you, you know? So then you've got to spend a week with the guy going, now you got to sit on your hands and do this whole thing for a week before, you know? And then now he doesn't do it anymore. But it's those little things like, he didn't, I tell him a hundred times, don't do this. But he didn't realize how often he did it or how long he would leave his hand up there. So just, you know, again, it's not rocket science, but you gotta just open up and be willing to look at yourself partially and make some changes. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Now a little bit of a devil's advocate. Uh, you want to be succinct, so you really boil it down, and then the interviewer says, Talk some more about that. And then it sort of invites you down the rabbit hole or, or down the digressions. And then you've, you know, so any thoughts on that conundrum? 
I think one thing I would say is just break up your sentences. So it might still be the same ideas and if you're embellishing, but I think it's what John said where it's easy to just keep keep talking. Because that way, if you do it in shorter sentences, it, it depends on what kind of interview setting you're in, but certainly if you're, if it's a more radio or, broad, or broadcast television or something like that, um, if, if you offer succinct sentences with periods, you know, at the end, then it gives the interviewer a chance to jump in with something else. Um, whereas if you don't do that and you don't take a pause, it doesn't mean to say, but then you can kind of gauge, like, should I keep going? Or give, or if they're a good interviewer, they'll just jump in on something that they think is interesting. I think, so, we, I think in general, most people are uncomfortable with silence. Yeah. And I think you don't realize that it's not as long of a silent period as short you think. Pause is fine. Yeah. <laughs> but breath, take a breath, because otherwise then you're like, why don't to be able to just keep going? Yeah. I got a good bridge for that. Tell me more about that. Because I think a really great, good place to go to in an interview is to talk about what you're excited about, because then the engagement comes alive. So if it's like, okay, so I have a show coming up and it's January 10th. Tell me more about that. Well, the reason why I'm so excited about this show is, and then release the passion part of this work, which couldn't even exist if you didn't have that in you. you know? So I like to just kind of match to it. You know, rather than, rather than regurgitating back to the place and blah, 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 fit that in at the end, but talk about what you're passionate about because that's why people are listening. Mm -hmm. I know that's why I'm listening. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I have a question more on the side of uh, getting, how uh, gaining interviews attention. Um, as someone who's just starting out, uh, when one is ready to release a project, um, how do you gain press attention? I mean, besides social media, what about? being a past to um, people in the media. That is a whole workshop on its own, which um, <laughs> which we will definitely do another one of those, because we've done that before. But but um, I will, I'll let Andrea answer this in, in, a, in a short way. But um, certainly also, if you ever want to come to the MMC, that's something we can definitely help you with in general. So uh, feel free to talk to me afterwards as well. But I'll let Andrea answer that succinctly. Yeah. I, think, <laughs> I think it really all boils down to um, timing and being, having something compelling to offer. Um, the reality is that like, someone in my position is getting tons of submissions and requests and pitches, and there might be 10 things that I really want to do um, and feature, but if uh, you know a certain band has a release show that week, that's probably the one that I'm gonna pick because I want it to be timely and I want my show to feel fresh. So I think it's, um, yeah, there's a lot of strategy that you can talk about, but I think a lot of it is um, just knowing who you're pitching, knowing what kind of timeline they're on, and what generally like when in um, a cycle they're going to cover something, and then making sure that you get in front of them at the right time. So again, research. So it goes back to what Sam Kelly was talking about preparing for the interview. The same is true when you're in the pitching media for interviews. So uh, knowing what Andrew's show does. It's a local show it's once a week, so she, I mean, she plans it further in advance because she's not doing it every day. Um, so um, we did do, actually Andrea and I were part of a workshop panel in, uh, in Winona a few weeks ago for our Caravan de Nord touring program and we actually videotaped that which talks about this topic. So I can share that with folks who are interested um, and we'll also share the video of tonight's workshop as well in case you want to share it with other people or go back to it uh, to go to our nuggets of wisdom that we've shared with you today. Um, but, uh, one thing oh yeah, sure. But um, you don't have to have a publicist. You don't. I mean, no. reporters are not. They don't have a block on there for normal people. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so, but, so to their point, if you've done your research and you know, you know, she does this show every week. This makes perfect sense. She may or may not like like the content, but don't be afraid to go directly yeah. to them. You know, if you're thoughtful and smart and it makes sense. Again, you're your best publicist or worst publicist. It's all, you know, you don't have to hire somebody to do that. But um, that's yeah. the I would rather talk to her. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with that, we'll, we'll wrap things up. Uh, again, our next workshop is actually is Wednesday, November 16th, uh, promoting music being you on social media. So we're going to continue this of not just like how to get likes, but really how to make authentic connections be yourself on social media so that's going to be the next workshop 
We have flyers about that. And uh, um, again, we'll email you with the video of this workshop. And uh, feel free to talk to us afterwards. But thank you for coming. Thanks to our panel. Thank you.